Well, what a blessing to be together just a few days before Christmas and to be together, uh, in fact, this morning, I bet you saw it too, as I was uh, driving, it looked like diamonds, you know, all the ice was just uh, on the road and I thought, it's a little bit like the, the crystal sea and the see-through golden streets that are going to glisten in heaven. So uh, as you're sliding on the roads, think of heaven, okay, and, uh, and uh, be ready for it. But let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke and chapter 2. What we're looking at is five lives that God immortalized. He, he forever has put into his word these five lives surrounding the birth of Christ, but what he points out in each one of them is what they gave to the Lord Jesus. Now what is amazing is that almost every gift that they give would not be on most people's gift list this year. Uh, for anybody. I mean, it's just not how we think what the Lord points out. And you'll see what I mean, especially, there are only three verses devoted to Anna. She is the, the minimal of all the accounts. And yet, there is probably more to ponder from these few short words about her that God teaches us about what it is that, that she gave to him. But chapter 2 of Luke, verse 36, giving to God like Anna, uh, a life of thanks. And that's the key we're going to see in a moment that when she gets, in verse 38, as soon as she gets to do something, she bursts into thanks to God. But before we get there, remember where we've been. Each of these train us in and, and give us the elements and challenge us. Each of these five lives, and this is only the fourth one, but each of them talks about how to have a life focused on God. Now, if you really think about it, that's really all that will matter someday when we're laying, if we die old, laying in the hospital bed, you know, all hooked up to everything, you know, with everybody uh, looking at the, the monitors, you know. Uh, I, I go to the hospital so often that it's so interesting. The sicker they are, the less people look at them, and the more they're looking at those monitors. You know, all that array of the everything, the oxygenization and the pulse and the blood pressure and whatever else they're monitoring. And, and most people, when they're at that place, aren't thinking about how many vacation homes they have, how many garages with cars in them they have, how many accounts they have to get over the 250000 per account. You know, you've got to spread it out if you got it. They're not thinking about that. If they're believers, they're thinking about how much of their life they live for the one they're soon to meet. And see, that's what these all excel in that we're looking at, these lives. The first one we saw was Mary. And if we give to God like Mary, we'll give a life of consecration. And, and we, I mean, the elements we saw, that she gave her attention to God, she gave her independence to God, she gave her body to God, she gave her future to God, she gave her schedule to God. And that's what a life of consecration is. And we saw her life. Then, giving to God like the shepherds, they gave their life wrapped up. Now, the more intricate the wrapping, the more, you know, you don't even want to unwrap a present sometimes. It's so beautifully wrapped. I don't know if you've gotten those. You can tell someone wrapped it. I mean, it's the kind where they, I mean, they crease. It isn't just slapped together, you know, with the extra slit underneath. I mean, they really, and they use stickers and labels and even use that little tape that you don't go, you know, you don't tear it off. It's in little chunks, you know, and it's underneath and it really works. And and we, we notice nice wrapping. God notices humility when that's the wrapping. And what we saw about the shepherds is that they listened to God when he spoke. That's a sign of humility. They responded to God immediately. That's another sign of humility. My, my desires are not more important than yours, so I'm going to respond immediately. You can tell how humble a person is by how quickly they follow direct command. If they look at you and kind of just give you the once over because they're thinking if they should even respond to that, there's not a high level of humility in their life. See, quickness to respond to a command is a mark of a humble servant. And the shepherds had that. Uh, they were also willing to go against the crowd. They were, they were not so proud that it would have intimidated them. They sought Christ until they found him. There's that persistence. And then they were willing to tell everyone. 
the good news. That they didn't worry about what people would say about them or think about them. They just, they humbly wrapped their lives. And then last week, we saw Simeon. And, and he gave to the Lord a life of walking in the Spirit. And, and he sought, and, and we don't know when this started in his life, but, but it was full-blown in the scriptures, those 14 verses we looked at him, is he, he sought each day to be emptied of self. Do you know how we know that? Because you can't be full of self and full of the Spirit. They're mutually incompatible. The Holy Spirit gets grieved and quenched and, and is not filling us when we're full of anything that grieves and quenches him, which pride and other things do that. So Simeon was emptying of self so the Spirit could be filling him. And as the Spirit filled him, the Spirit illumined his heart to God's will. And by the way, Spirit-filled people know God's will. Uh, the writer of Proverbs put it this way, the righteous are as bold as a lion. A righteous person, which is another word for a spirit-filled person, is bold as a lion because they know the Lord's will. But the wicked run when no one's even chasing them. There's a skitty, skitterishness of, of those who are hiding sin. And, and they run even when no one is pursuing them. So Simeon emptied self, filled with spirit, illumined by spirit, led by the spirit. And that's, that's what a life of walking with God. Well, this morning, we also can learn from Anna's life to give to God a life of thanks. And, and just before we read the text, just, I want you to just notice two little things. Uh, look at verse 36. And I want to introduce you to the life of Anna. And in your mind, just underline two words in the text. First, in verse 36, she was of great age. Underline that in your mind. And think old, okay? Usually, in our culture, old is not good unless it's, you know, uh, an antique or a coin or, you know what I mean. But old gear is what you give to the goodwill. And old clothes, you know, is what you you know, get rid of or give away, and, and old anything, you know, it's just put it out. And, and Anna was old, great age. But look at verse 37. There's a second word. It says, a widow of about 84 years. Now, underline in your mind a second word. Old is the first one, great age. A widow of 84 years means alone. So two words can sum up this, this three-verse amazing woman. She was old, she was alone. Now, that of 84 years is fascinating. I uh, read every book that commented on this that I have in my library. And you know what? It's very interesting. There are two schools of thought. The, the, the high-tech, you know, Greek text people say that the form of this text means that, that she was... Uh, 84 years since she became a widow. So that means she was over 100 years old, which is very hard to believe anybody could have lived that long in the first century world. But very likely, that's why she's called of great age. I met someone this morning who is uh, 98. And so uh, six years to go on that. But uh, to be of great age like Anna. But, but the other school says that she was 84 total. But it doesn't matter. 84 means old, and a widow means alone. Yet from this account, God shows us this old and alone woman was also a vibrant, filled with joy, overflowing with God's word, and a woman in love with the Lord. We detect the oldness and aloneness. People that met her did not. They saw vibrancy, overflowing thankfulness and deep love for the Lord. You see, our circumstances can either color what everyone sees in us negatively, or our circumstances can cause us, like Anna did, to draw upon the Lord and we reflect His glory and virtue and praise instead of our own loneliness and elderly weaknesses and all that. And Anna beautifully shows this. Think about the limited resources Anna had to live the life we see. She had God's word and the spirit of God, but just like most of the Old Testament saints in the early church, she didn't probably have a personal copy. I mean, she didn't tote around a copy of the word. 
They just didn't have that. I mean, if you saw the Isaiah scroll, it was 40 feet long. I mean, can you imagine if you had the whole Bible? I mean, you'd have to have a little cart behind you to, to bring it with you in all those scrolls. And so what, what we see is she had limited access to the word. Maybe around the temple she was allowed in some, you know, synagogue place to, to see and to read. But it was very limited. But what's amazing is, even though she had limited access to the word, Anna flourished because she had unlimited access to God. Guess what? So do we. And there's no reason why any of us shouldn't flourish in our Christian lives like Anna did. Her limited access to a personal copy did not limit her longing for pursuit of and, and lifelong loving the Lord Jesus, the promised one who would bring redemption. Well, is she a godly woman? Yes. Was she perfect? No. No, she was not perfect. But she had a life dominated by choices to obey and follow the Lord. And, and I guess a life of giving thanks is a life that's dominated by good choices to love and serve and follow the Lord. Anna, like any other godly woman, may fail here and there, sin now and then, give up from time to time, but her life is characterized. Her life is dominated by choices to seek the Lord and to follow God's word. And that describes Anna. And that describes a godly woman. And what we see this morning is what God always wants and what God says can describe any one of us. Because all of us have unlimited access to the Lord this morning and every day of our life and every night of our life and every in-between part of our life. We can have that unlimited access to the Lord. Well, Anna is just what any woman who knows the Lord would want to become. Anna is what we could call a godly Old Testament woman of grace. God's grace, and by the way, the word grace first shows up in the Bible in Genesis 6 with Noah, and it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God's grace has been operating cover to cover. God's spirit has operated cover to cover in the Bible. And every time you find a Noah or a Daniel or a Hannah or a New Testament Hannah, Anna, Anna in the New Testament, Greek is Hannah in the Old Testament, same word. You find someone who is partaking of the Spirit of God and the grace of God. And we have unlimited access and even greater because we don't have to stand on the outside listening, trying to catch more of God's Word. We have it in so many forms and so much around us. Well, as we read this incredible account, it's Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 36, all the way through verse 38. Let's stand together and let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts this morning. Not just another Christmas message so we can go off in the ice and do whatever we're going to do, but this is a time to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me. Kind of like Samuel in the Old Testament. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And I want to respond to what you say. Let's ask him to speak to us. Luke 2.36, now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. Now look up for just a minute. I can't let that go by. There's a horrible error by Herbert W. Armstrong called British Israelitism. You've probably heard of the worldwide, you know, Armstrong cult. And, and it's based on that the tribes of Israel have been lost and they've reconstituted in the British Empire and America's part of it and it's all this weird stuff. The tribes were never lost. There's one right there. Asher. David uh, was from Judah. That tribe is still around. Christ was a descendant. I mean, uh, Benjamin, that's the tribe Saul was, you know, that became Paul. I mean, the 12 tribes, you can reconstitute almost all 12 of them in the New Testament. And by the time you get to Revelation, certainly God hasn't lost them. So, but look down at the Bible. They're not lost, okay? But keep reading about this. It says, she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Verse 38, and coming in that 
instant she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Three verses. What a woman. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for the inspiration of your word, by your spirit, through prophets, as the spirit of Christ who is in them guided them to write down exactly what it is you wanted us to know and what it is we need to have faith. Faith comes by hearing your word. To be sanctified, we're sanctified by thy truth. To be saved, we receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Oh Lord, how I pray that this word that you inspired, these three verses filled with the very words from God, would speak to our hearts. We invite you to speak to us through your word, by your spirit. And I pray that someone this morning would decide that I want to give to God, like Anna. I want to give a life of thanks to God. And Lord, what a blessing it will be to see you transform us as we invite you more and more into our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. As you're seated, there are seven elements about Anna's life that we can see by each of these phrases. And I'm going to put the phrase up there. In verse 36, it starts out, it says, Now there was one Anna. And what we see is that Anna's life mattered to God. God knew all about her. God knew where Anna lived, what she did, how she thought, what she felt. God knew her. He knew the power that just one life can have for him. You understand that? There was one. God really loves to work and primarily works through individuals. Now, he collects individuals together into the body of Christ, and, and this is God's primary focus right now, the church. But the church is made up of individual, as Peter put it, living stones. And so God looks down in Jerusalem, and there was one individual that mattered very much to him, that he knew. He knew her before her birth. He had designed and engineered her for his glory. Like every one of us, Psalm 139 says. We, we were intricately woven together by God. And our life matters to him. Anna's life mattered to God. God uses individuals. God wants you and me to allow him, to invite him, and to welcome him to use us. That's what Anna found. And that's what God saw in her life. God saw a woman, and he found one that he looks for all throughout the earth, one who will give her life back to the Lord. Now, for just a moment, we'll do a little Bible drill. Go back with me to 2 Chronicles. See how fast you can find 2 Chronicles. And it'll give you a New Year's resolution. Memorize those books of the Bible, right? I mean, don't trust the tabs and don't, you know, use the the crutch of the electronic, know where they are because there's, there's something fascinating about going through the scriptures, uh, actually seeing the scope of them. But Second Chronicles, look at chapter 16 and verse 9 because one of the secrets of how God operates, we see present in Anna's life. But when you see it present, a lot of times you can look back in the scriptures and see how she knew that that was something that triggered God's response. And so Anna, uh, being as old as she was and hanging around the temple as much as she did and being so full of God's word because she was a prophetess, which we're going to see in a moment means she spoke and overflowed with God's word. Not, as we'll see, she, didn't, she wasn't a scripture writer. She wasn't a prophet that wrote down revelation. She was a prophetess, which always in the Old Testament meant she spoke forth the already revealed word of God. In other words, she just spoke God's word. But what was one she knew? Right here. Look at 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, do you know what, what's going on in Anna's life? God looked down, and his eyes, the eyes of the Lord, are scanning the earth. You know, I was reading about the new um, U.S. government, military-funded, largest telescope that's ever been made. 
I mean, it's, it's a hundred times bigger than the Hubble, okay? You've heard of the Hubble, right? And, and this thing's a hundred times bigger, only it's not pointing at the galaxies. They're assembling it and pointing it this way. The largest telescope, and they're going to make three of them, is going to be at 22,300 miles out, which is geosynchronous orbit. And this thing's going to have the resolution to see nose hairs on people on one third of the Earth's surface. It can see everything on a third. And if they have three of them, they can continuously watch at any time the surface of the Earth. They're trying to be like God, who does constantly watch. And his eyes run to and fro throughout the Earth. And he's looking for one thing. He's looking for someone who no one else but him can see this because he sees the inside. He's looking for our, our core processor, the center of our being. Our heart is loyal to him, faithful to him, longing, seeking, wanting his approval. That's what loyalty is. You want to please the one that's watching. And so 2 Chronicles 16.9 is a little secret about how God operates. That's what he explained to us. And probably in her long life, Anna had heard or even read these words. And so what did Anna see? Now go back to, to Luke chapter 2 with me. Anna was right there, and God says, there's one. Look at those first words of verse 36. And there was one, and there's one of them. One of those whose hearts is loyal to me, and her name is Anna. Do you see, that's how God introduces her to us. She was one who was a Second Chronicles 16.9 type of person. All you see about her is that the central element of her life was God. Now, she had everything else, a family, a past, events, heartaches, everything else. But the center core that God's eyes saw was she was loyal to him. God is looking for those who will unreservedly, completely pledge their lives to his will, to his plans, and to his bidding. And the gift God wants from each of us this year is to, like Anna, give your life to God. And I've told you this many times. There was a turning point in my life. I remember, uh, you know, I, I was perpetually in school from 1962 to 19. 99. I was never unenrolled for 37 years. I'm a real slow learner. And, and as I was in one space of that in the 70s, I remember that I used to memorize and, and jog at night. You know, the older you get, I used to jog, now I jiggle. You know, it's just interesting how, you know, time takes its toll. But I used to jog at night this, this two-mile circuit, and I would actually be mumbling my verses. And I remember I was learning this verse. And I was jogging along at night, you know, with just those, those uh, lights so that you don't stumble on, but the stars were so bright. And I was jogging along and saying, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. And all of a sudden it struck me. It went from being a verse I was memorizing for some class to all of a sudden I stopped and I looked up. And I looked around because I didn't want to be embarrassed and there was no <laughs> jogger in sight. And so I said, Here's one. My heart is loyal to you. Show yourself strong to me, who you are. You see, God, this is true. God is really looking. And when you're driving or when you're sitting at your computer or when you're going throughout your day, sitting in class, whatever it is you do, standing at the sink, you can just pause and say, here's one. I'm like Anna, I'm giving my life back to you. You see, God wants us to be loyal. And, and we, he knows we fail, he knows our frame, he's already died for all of our sins, he already knows them all. Yet he loves us. But our love should make us want to more and more deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and the flesh and the devil and the world because we're loyal to him. Number one, the gift God wants from each of us is 
to give our life to God. Secondly, look at, look at the next part of verse 36. I mean, do you see why there's so many lessons here? The next one says, a prophetess. You know what that means? That means Anna spoke God's word. That's what Old Testament prophetesses did. They are never recorded as having written down any part of God's word, the Bible. There, there are no women authors of the Bible. No woman is ever recorded getting direct divine revelation that was, that was on the par of Scripture. And that's just how God ordained things. But they were not bringing new inspired revelation. Rather, Anna was one of four noted Old Testament women who were noted for speaking God's word to people. They repeated God's truth. They were these women that were so full of God's word, God instrumentally used them at times to declare what he had already said that you remember people didn't tote around. And so he needed people that toted around in their hearts and minds and at appropriate moments spoke it. That's what a prophetess was. In the New Testament we find Philip had four daughters who did the same thing. So there, there is this amazing giftedness of being so full of the Word of God that it comes out. And that's what Anna had. Anna spoke God's Word. Anna was not a revealer of God's Word, but she was an affirmer of God's Word. Anna was a conduit for God. While he promised her that, that he would be with her, she knew that when he prompted her that she would speak for him. She was careful to speak his words, not her own. And that meant that Anna was full and overflowing with God's word. She was known as one who knew what God had said. She knew when his statements on any situation were needed to be affirmed. And she was right there speaking for God. Anna spoke for God. That's what prophetess means. Now that always makes me pause. The people of Jerusalem knew that Anna was a prophetess, that she spoke God's word. How did they know that? They watched her. They saw what her life was all about. I wonder this morning, what overflows your life, your thoughts, your words? Do others know that you have so steeped yourself in God's truth that when you talk, you affirm what God has said? See, that's a choice. We can either be known as the guru of whatever. You can fill in the blank. I mean, people do know. I mean, some people you talk to, they're up on, you know, the, the latest, uh, you know, intrigues and conspiracy things. They're those people. And then there's the ones that they know, the financial. I mean, I, I made the mistake of asking someone about bitcoins. Wow. I mean, a half hour later, they took a breath. I mean, I knew what they were into. By the way, bitcoins are being mined in Iceland 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in a server room just north of the Arctic Circle. Read about it in the New York Times today. Uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating. But it's not eternal. So what are you steeped in? Are you... you can meet some people. You can mention one thing about sports. They can tell you for the last 30 years the statistics on everybody that you've never heard of, and on and on it goes, but you know what they're steeped in. Anna was steeped in God. God is looking for those who will let his words so richly, Colossians 3, 16 and 17 says, dwell in them, that whenever God needs them, they will speak for him. The gift God wants from each of us this year is to, like Anna, give your words to God. And the only way you can do that is to let God's word come in, saturate, and then the words that come out are gifts for him. Because what lives and abides forever is the word of God, nothing else. Whatever the word of God has touched, transformed, and indwells lasts forever. The rest will burn and rust and get stolen. Well, thirdly, look at the next part in verse 36. Look at this, this pedigree. The daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher, she was of great age. She had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. This woman was a widower of about 84 years. Anna lived a normal, painful, struggling, sorrow-filled life. I mean, there's no way that you can't detect that from 
those words. Anna lived what is normal or typical in human life. She was born into a family she didn't choose. She grew up with little say on most things. She married a man into whose hands she entrusted her future. The unexpected death of her life's partner struck her. The days of loneliness that followed, years of emptiness, growing physical weakness, and inescapably declining health. And I'm not reading into it. That's just what everybody goes through. That's just life. Loss, sorrow, weakness. In fact, that could describe what most women throughout history have experienced. Remember, all the details that you see were put into the Bible by God. He's the one that put that in there. Why did we need to know Faneuil? I mean, I think of Faneuil Hall in Boston, but Faneuil was a person. And of the tribe of Asher. Wow. Asher was not around Jerusalem. She migrated. She didn't live in her ancestral land. She was here. So, I mean, there's a lot of things, but why did God put that in there? Well, God chose to let us know these events because he wants us to know Anna had a normal life. She had a painful life. And, and most of the events in Anna's life were completely out of her control. The stuff you read here, she didn't have any control over. That's what this whole list is about. All of the details, all of what we could call the circumstances of her life, she didn't have any control in. She didn't have control in her husband dying. She didn't have control in her parents. She didn't have control in even when she got married back then. Almost every part of her life's circumstances were completely out of her control. That's what we would call today our circumstances too. We didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose how we were brought up. Uh, our marital situation, we only have half of a part in. Our health, I mean, we can, you know, somewhat help our health, but there's so much they're finding is genetically predisposed for all kinds of uh, maladies. Most of our circumstances, even today in life, we usually do not control. And God is showing us that Anna had life circumstances that could have produced a great variety of responses. Faneuil? What if he was a, not a stellar dad? She could have gone through life blaming everything on him. How about her husband? Sickly guy that died, left her alone? She could have really run on that for a long time. She had all these life circumstances. But God is showing us that she trusted what God had allowed to happen to her, and Anna saw her circumstances as being from God's hand. How do I know that? Because she bursts into thanks to God. Did you know a person can't thank God if they don't? I mean, they can mouth it, but they can't be as realistic as she was. Anna truly thanked God. She saw her circumstances, her, her family she was placed in, her upbringing, her husband, his death, her being alone for 84 years. She saw those as being from God's hand. That's why she can so readily burst into thanks like she does in verse 38. Anna gave her circumstances into God's hands. Yet, have you noticed how many people chafe against their circumstances. Oh, I have the worst professor. I would get straight A's if it wasn't for that professor. I have the worst boss. I would be the president of the company if it wasn't for my boss. I have the worst whatever. And if I didn't have a better coach, I would be the star of the law. And their circumstances, they don't see us from God's hands. If you have a horrible teacher, and I bet there is at least one out there at every level, and you, if you got them, that's a circumstance from God to see what your response is. You understand, the Israelites didn't choose their taskmasters, but God was watching to their, see their reaction to their taskmasters. And God was looking to see how Hannah was treated by Penina, her, her you know, count other wife uh, that, that was always bothering her. And, and God was looking at, at the hearts of each of these people. And God is looking at us, our response to our circumstances. God is looking for those who will trust all the circumstances of life that are beyond their control into the loving, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, and the absolutely wise hands of God. By the way, he does control our circumstances. And wisdom, the, the attribute of God of wisdom means God knows the best way to accomplish 
his will in our lives. That's his wisdom. And he may put in the circumstances of our life a fanuel, an upbringing, a marriage, a husband that dies, widowhood, and whatever else. And that's his wisdom. And he wants us to give him a gift this year, to be like Anna and give your circumstances to God. The things that we can't really change in life. I mean, most people don't like the boss or the teacher or the whatever, but I mean, what's the choice, you know? Unemployment, uh, you know, failure, lose the credit, whatever. See, we have to entrust to an all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing God who governs circumstances and say, Lord, I didn't pick my parents. I didn't pick my family. In Anna's world, I didn't even pick my husband. You are in charge of my circumstances. How do you want me to react, respond? That's what giving our circumstances to the Lord is all about. Well, here's another element. Look at verse 37 at the end. Luke 2, 37 who did not depart from the temple. Anna just couldn't stay away from God's house. That's what it says. It doesn't really say she lived in the temple. Women couldn't live in the temple. They didn't allow that, okay? It's not like, you know, you go to L.A. and a lot of the major cities and they're the homeless and they live everywhere. They just push their carts and have their cardboard and, you know, it, it's just a part of life. No. What this is saying is you couldn't keep her away from there. I mean, you just couldn't keep her away if she had, boom, she was there. Have you ever thought of that? Did you know most people are like that? Did you know this morning there's something that anybody that really knows you, there's something they can't keep you away from, me away from, there's something we gravitate toward, we just can't get enough of it? That's what Anna was like. She just couldn't get enough of, of God. Now notice the details God has chosen to reveal for us. He could have told us about what Anna looked like. Like what color her hair was. Didn't you wonder about that? Or what kind of clothes she wore? Or how beautiful her complexion may have been. She was either 84 or 104. I mean, wow, what did her skin look like? How smart was she? How artistic? How accomplished may she have been back in Asher High? You know, I mean, what, was she a cheerleader back then? I mean, we just, I mean, at Facebook, it would have all that stuff. Nope. Not a word about all the details most people are eager to find out about a person. God goes right to what matters most to him. Did you catch that? See, that's, the, that's what's so exciting about reading the Bible. You're looking over God's shoulder, looking at someone's life. And you're seeing, it's almost you can look through his eyes. You can see what he's looking at, what he sees. That's what's in the Bible. It's what he sees. God is emphasizing something. Anna just couldn't refrain from being at God's house, with God's people, around God's worship. She was glued, she was drawn, she was riveted, she was captivated by the things of God so much. Now listen to this. People associated her with God and God's word. Remember, she was a prophetess. That means totally tied to God's word and God's temple, his house, where his glory dwelt. Now, the question this morning is, what draws us so much that we can't stay far away from it? And whatever it is that draws us speaks volumes to God and to anybody that knows us. We could say that Anna couldn't stay away from there. Talking about the temple. She just couldn't stay away from there. What does God and those who know you see as where you just can't stay away from there? The gym. The table, you know, eating, the computer, the game. What, what can't you just stay away from? Characterizes our lives. Are you known as a shopper? You just can't stay away from stores and sales. And everybody that knows you, they say, I remember when, when we pastored in New England, um, there was a woman, I think the stores paid her to come there. <laughs> she had cornered the, the coupon thing, and there used to be, I don't, I'm not really a shopper, that's not one of my, I have many problems, that's not one of them. Uh, but I, at that time, there was triple coupons at All Max, that was the name of the supermarket, triple. I mean, this woman, 
she had, you know, the $1 coupons and tripled them on the $2.99 things and they gave her a penny back or something. I mean, she knew how to work the system. You went to her house, we went to her house. We went to her basement, she had 500 Keebler whatevers. I said, what are you doing with those? Coupons. I said, what are you going to do with them? I got them. I thought, oh, you spent countless hours. I mean, she had, she had downy fabric, whatever, whatever was the deal of the, and she just had them bunkered away in that basement. And I, I always wondered, boy, I hope the house doesn't burn. It'll be a toxic cloud. You know, all the stuff that's piled and packed down there. Everyone at church knew. If I said her name, the coupon lady, she overwhelms the stores. She eats and sleeps and drinks and knows. And I mean, she would go through dumpsters looking for the Velasquez inserts in the Sunday paper. She, when she drove, her husband had to stop. She was always getting anybody that threw away a paper. She had to have the coupon. She was a shopper. Now you say, I'm not like that. I have an app, right? You know, the Black Friday app, you know. I don't waste my time. I just go to the stores. Yeah, but do people know that's what draws you? That's interesting. So before God someday, he's going to say, what were you drawn to in your life? And you'd say, shopping. That's interesting. That wasn't Anna. Are you known as an online presence? You comment, you post, you update, you upload, you pin, you poke, and you send pictures about everything possible. You just can't stay away from your electronic devices, can you? Or are you drawn to God so much you just can't refrain from praying? You love to hear about needs and people and ministries. Listening to God speak in his word. Thinking about how incredible he is all day long. You just can't stay away from God's presence in his people. God is looking for those who can't stay away from any place associated with God. The gift he wants from each of us this year is to give him our time. You can give it to shopping, you can give it to your electronic presence, constantly polishing it, or you can give it to God. One more, and this is fascinating. Verse 37 says, Anna worshiped God with, from, by, and through her spirit. That word served is not the normal word for serving in the Bible. It's a very unique word, and it's a very special word. Anna was not only physically drawn to God's place and God's people and God's fellowship, she was also spiritually drawn to worshiping him. Anna knew that the greatest way to serve God was to start with worship. You remember Jesus said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only, that's Matthew 4.10, shalt thou serve. Same word that Jesus uses. Worship is not merely music. Worship is giving an offering to God, and it can be an offering of words through music, but that is only the start. Worship is when God overwhelms our minds, when God fills our thoughts, when God dominates our will, when God transforms our desires and our emotions and our feelings, and those are all our non-material parts. Worship is when we give our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength to the Lord. That's what serving him. Latareo is serving through worship. Anna could serve God in her spirit, in her mind, by her offerings of feelings of love and devotion to him. You know, she couldn't carry wood in the temple. She was too old. Uh, she couldn't cut up the oxen and the lambs and everything else because she was a woman. And they weren't allowed to do that by the Levitical laws. But Anna could worship God equally or more than every priest and every scribe and every other person that went through the temple. Because Anna had learned she could serve God in her spirit, in her mind, by her offerings of feelings of love and devotion to God, Anna chose to harness her whole being to a Godward focus. Anna gave herself devotedly, consciously to worship God. She became a servant of worship to God. You know, William Temple, um, two generations ago, defined worship theologically in the, in the worship books as a measure of our personal health. He, he, he was a, a great British teacher, and he said that the worship 
temperature of your life tells your spiritual health. And this is, this is basically what he said. He said, true worship quickens our conscience by the holiness of God. So our conscience is not dulled and it's not, you know, uh, totally deadened by sin. It's quickened by the holiness of God. Our minds are fed with the truth of God, so our minds are growing and healthy. It purges our imagination by the beauty of God. The beauty of God pushes out bad imaginations. Uh, you know, in, in Ezekiel, it talks about God once allowed Ezekiel to see what was in a group of men's minds. He says, here, you want to see what they're thinking about? Dig through the wall, and what you see inside there is what I see inside their minds. And Ezekiel stuck his head in and pulled his head back out, and he said, that was the most vile, horrible thing. God says, that's what I see in their minds. You know what worship does? Worship purges our imagination, what our minds picture by the beauty of God. God's beauty pushes that other out. It opens our heart to the love of God so we become compassionate like Christ. It devotes our will to the purpose of God. In fact, this word for serving God isn't the normal word. It's the word that Jesus first spoke in the temptation when he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. It's the same word that Paul opens Romans and he says, that I serve God through worship, Romans 1.9. It's the same word that Paul uses in Philippians 3.3 3 that says, those who are really saved worship God in the spirit. And the word worship is this, la tereo, serve. Serve God by worshiping him. It's the same word in the Old Testament that Joshua used. He said, as for me and my house, we will, that word, the Lord. Most of us have, we will serve the Lord. It's serve him by worshiping him. It's a great word. By the way, in Revelation 7, verse 15, and Revelation 22, 3, the saints, when they're gathered in heaven around the throne, the eternal gift they give is the same word. They serve God by offering worship. God is looking for those who can't stay away from any opportunity to offer their worshipful service to God. The gift God wants from each of us this year is to, like Anna, give our devoted worship to him. We just can't stay away from it. Well, there's a, another one. This is interesting. In verse 37, there's an added insight how she served the Lord. It says she served with fastings and prayers night and day. Anna offered spiritual disciplines. That, that self-denial is fasting and God-seeking is prayer. She denied self and cried out to God as a disciplined choice throughout her last days. She learned the secret of how to keep her body, her flesh in check. We can fast from food or we can fast from special things that are favorites, things that draw us. We can fast from them to remind our flesh that God alone is worthy of our deepest hungerings and longings. Anna served God by denying what her appetite wanted and by pursuing talking to him. It could become a modern spiritual discipline to fast from our favorite movies Fast from our favorite games. How long can you last? Have you ever tried that? Uh, to, to fast from the internet? Have you ever unplugged? Can you unplug? Did you know sociologists and psychiatrists are finding that there's an anxiety that our modern generation comes to when they're not online? They might miss something. They don't care how much they're missing from God. They might miss something online if there's not Wi-Fi or if they're out of range of cable for their computer. How long can you fast from social media? How about shopping? We can learn to fast from anything in order to affirm that God is most important. Now, you know, I love coffee. I really do. In fact, I could eat coffee and oatmeal three meals a day. I mean, I, I don't really care. I love coffee. And so I regularly go through a coffee fast. And I want to tell my body, you can give me as many headaches as you want to give me. You can make me feel as miserable as I want, but I, I am not going to let you run the show. It's our spirit is to control our body, not our body to control our spirit. The gift God wants from each of us is to give our spiritual disciplines to God. And then this, this is the ending on verse 38. 
Anna gave thanks to God. Coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord. She spoke of him to all of his redemption. Anna was on God's schedule. You notice it says, coming in that instant. <laughs> That's another detail the Lord puts in. Boom. What instant is it? Right after Simeon. I mean, can you imagine? It's implied Simeon was old. It's stated that Anna was greatly of age. And, and just as this probably older man was going through this, you know, excitement of getting to hold Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, in his arms, at that instant, Anna steps in. This one who the eyes of the Lord had found because her heart was loyal to him. And he directed her at that instant. She was on his schedule. She was ready to offer him her overflowing offering of thanks. She was so sure that of God, she could talk about him to anybody who was seeking him. Anna gave the fruit of her lips, like Hebrews 13, 15 calls all of us to do. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Do you know how we praise God? By thanking him for our circumstances that we can't control. You see, she had surrendered that, and she had that thanksgiving. What's amazing is that's what we're going to be doing in heaven. Revelation 4, 9, and 10 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and throw their crowns before the throne saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. God is looking for those who will look at life, see God's hand, and offer thanks. The gift God wants from each of us this year is to, like Anna, give our thanks to God. And so, that becomes another element. We can give our life, like Mary, in consecration. We can give our life wrapped in humility, like the shepherds. We can give our life of walking in step with the Spirit, like Simeon did. And we can learn, like Anna, to give God a life of thanks. But it starts by saying, Lord, all those things I didn't choose in life, you did. And I thank you that you're running my life. And as you're looking down, I want you to know I'm here. I'm one whose heart is completely loyal to you. Now this morning I thought we can um, end by thanking the Lord. So let's all stand. And here's, here's a great hymn that talks about how thankful we are that God is so wise and powerful that everything that he has done, he has shown he's faithful to his attributes, to his promised word, to all that he has revealed of himself. And there's such a thankfulness that comes by walking through life, knowing who's in control of the things we can't control, but what we can control are our hearts and lives and thoughts and schedules we give to him. What a, what a privilege. Let's, let's sing to the Lord, and then I'll close in prayer. <clears throat> let's see. <clears throat> Everyone clear your throat. Here we go. <laughs> if I can get on the right key. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see.
and the greatest faithfulness is he knows our frame that we're dust he knows that we're sinners and yet he's already pardoned us for every past every present and every future sin and you know what the deterrent is for the future sin I love him more and more and more and I want to displease him less and less and less let's sing to him before we go pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today Father, I pray you would find us faithfully offering thanks to you for our circumstances. I pray that we would learn from Anna and give our lives, our worship, not be able to stay away from there because we love you. I pray for anybody that doesn't have our hope, the assurance of forgiveness, the knowledge of strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. I pray that at the end of the service, as the elders and our Titus II women are here with your word to open and to pray, that you would draw to yourself any who need to make a decision, maybe to bow in faith and cry out to you for salvation, or just to restart that wonderful life of serving you. But we pray we would give to you our focus this Christmas time and for the rest of our lives we pray in Jesus name we pray and all God's people said amen, amen. God bless you as you go